Hey there, strategic entrepreneurs. I'm Crystal Hunt. And I'm Michela Mitrani. We are here to help you save time, money, and energy as you level up your writer's career. Welcome to the James Bond episode 007 of the Strategic Authorpreneur Podcast. Ooh. On today's show, we are going to tackle what personally I find one of the most challenging, but also one of my favorite aspects of the publishing process, which is connecting with our readers. So this is something a lot of people struggle with, I know, is, is where... Where do you find them and how do you get them to talk to you and how do you not feel like a bit of a spammy stalker person when you are, you know, sending out emails to your list and and trying to put stuff on social but not seem like you're just a walking billboard and how do you authentically engage with people? So I'm curious to hear from you, sir, what have been some sort of challenges and highlights of connecting with your readers? I'm going to be very old-fashioned and I'm going to reveal something to you, okay? This is not the best way you necessarily connect with readers because it's fewer uh, than the internet, but uh, my favorite ways, maybe some of you, I guess it is in person. And uh, why did I say that it's not necessarily the best way? It is because uh, there is a limited amount of space in a conference room or it's a limited amount of space in a room in general but I love doing it. I love to see the face of the person that maybe is listening to one of my readings of my books. I love to experience the kind of feedback that I get when I'm maybe a vendor at an event and selling my books. I love to get like feedback uh, real life. Um, this is the way I love connecting with people, like shaking hands uh, um, and uh, really, really get to know them and understanding a bit more about myself in the process because you always understand something about yourself when you are at an event, any kind of event. It can be a book fair. Uh, it can be like when you are doing blue pencils or things. You, I don't know, I think you grow up like a, as a human being. But is it necessarily good for book sales or uh, to reach more people? Not necessarily. That's why me and Crystal are here. And that's why we're going to tell you a lot of awesome ways uh, to get uh, to in touch with more people and more readers. Now, I told you that uh, my favorite way is offline. But I do recognize the importance of the online ways. And there are several different ways that you can connect with readers. One of the words that it's more in the mouth of everybody is social media. Uh, you got the newsletter if you have one, and hopefully after six episodes, you have started the newsletter of our podcast, you started something like that, hopefully. Um, uh, there, there is uh, the group that you are part of online or offline. For example, if you're writing romance, uh, a romance group on Facebook uh, uh, or uh, an association. Uh, for example, in, Van in Vancouver, there is the Greater Vancouver Writer Association uh, that was... Uh, came from romance writers. Now it's a bit more uh, generic and broad, but that could be a starting point. So when you understand what exactly is the genre you want to write, um, and in the crystal case is different from my different genre, I think you have figured out 50% of more of the stuff you need to do. Because once you know the genre you want to uh, write, you know what kind of people you want to meet and connect with. So you have just uh, taken off the equation something that uh, most of the people will never figure out because they will shoot at uh, just everything and everybody and uh, will miss most of the times. So what it is important is not just to find an audience, but your audience. And that's where super, hyper, extra extra hyper difficult because you have to do <laughs> researches and it, researches are things that not necessarily are exciting and um, me myself i'm in the process of finding people that are interested in the kind of work that i write i didn't figure that out yet i'm just starting out i do know crystal has more answer to that question but if there is one thing that i figure out is do that exercise. What kind of books are you writing? What kind of people are interested in your book? That's the audience. That's the people you want to connect uh, uh, 
uh, with them most. And we're going to talk about the site or instrument or resources you can use. But I think like that's the first question you need to ask yourself. What the crystal things? <laughs> yeah, no pressure. Um, so what do I think about where people connect up? I think um, there's a really interesting interview that's coming up in the next episode with Liza Palmer. And she is talking about social media and what's kind of happening in terms of trends and what we need to be thinking about. So I think if this is some something you want to deep dive into, make sure you definitely show up for the next episode. We, One thing I like to get people thinking about is who actually is your audience for your books? I mean, it's really tempting to just say everybody. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we try to default to the broadest possible group, but it's actually the opposite that you want to do, which is really drilling down into very specifically who is your audience and I think it can be really helpful to do the exercise that you may have heard mentioned before which is who is your ideal customer and if you can actually give them a name and a job and an age and you know a, a daily kind of life that they are living then you can target everything you are doing to be specifically beneficial for that person. And it will really help you avoid the trap of trying to do all the things in all the places. And one of the things that we, I think also have to look at is what do you enjoy doing? Because there are hundreds of platforms you could be on. There are so many tools, so many communities, so much stuff you could be a part of, but we cannot do everything. We really can't. There are a very limited number, actually, of hours in the day. That does not change. It does not get bigger. Even if you are efficient, there is still only a certain amount of energy and a certain amount of time you want to spend in this part of things. So for me, I sat down and I made a list of what are all the possible things I could do? Where are the platforms I could be on? And what am I enjoying? And where are my people? and then seeing what crosses over. So if your perfect uh, reader is, you know, maybe a mom of two who is in her, you know, late 20s to 40s, depending, um, then you can look at, okay, well, where do those people hang out? Is it Facebook? Is it Instagram? What, what are the platforms where those folks are? And then you can think about for your own content, what kind of stuff do you want to share? What platforms do you love? So for me, a lot of my readers hang out on Instagram and I really like taking pictures and I really like connecting in that format where I can look at my world in a different way and share bits and pieces of things on Instagram. Now it's not, I don't have a brand account in a way that some of the authors do. So that's another decision is, are you interacting with your readers as yourself or as your brand or as your characters and then seeing what fits? I don't like spending a lot of energy on being anything other than myself. So you'll find some pretty high consistency across channels. I, I just am me, but on Instagram. And so you'll see stuff that's, it's, you know, there's cocktails, there's, um, fun, friendly things. There's a lot Champagne, of board games. Yeah. There's, there's, there's a lot of bubbly because when I hit milestones, I get to open the little baby bottles of champagne. So yeah, there's a lot of drinking. Um, only when I'm doing all my work though. So I think that's, uh, that that's what you can expect from me, but I think that's also what you can expect the same kind of tone in my social profiles as in my books. So if you like the tone of my stories, which is about people connecting with people and, you know, finding joy in their daily lives and beautiful bits of nature, um, since it's all set in small towns, like that's what I, I take pictures on my daily walk and I post those. Like it's just, it's all just me. But, you know, other authors will have chosen to, you know, feature, I mean, I write romance, so feature hot security dudes as like a daily picture that that's something that some people do. It just, if that's what your books are about and that's what your audience is looking for, then and that's what you have fun doing, then hey, rock on with your bad self. It's just whatever makes sense for you and whatever you can sustain, right? Over time, I think it's consistency is really important. So yeah. I, 
yeah, I, for me, it's just decide what feels good to you because if you don't like it, you're not going to do it. And then it's, it doesn't do anything for you at all. And there is actually one thing that you said, like uh, knowing your audience. And uh, I know that that is true, for example, for some authors that are starting out. It is definitely applicable uh, to me. I'm trying to find ways to discover my audience in non-conventional way. And I'm telling you, I'm going to tell you now what I'm doing uh, and don't laugh, okay? Um, so I have decided a few months ago to start releasing stories for free. And I think I mentioned this before. It's because I want to understand exactly what people like about my stories. And I'm putting them for free because uh, I'm also learning how to write in my second language, which is English. Now, I did start in getting some feedback. How is this important or meaningful for this episode, which is connecting with your audience? It is meaningful because every single time I now get on a feedback from a reader, I'm going to use the word stalk the reader, but it's not the right word. But for example, I got to review um, yesterday uh, from uh, one of the short stories uh, I, I released on January, Glass into Steel. And uh, this person wrote like a, almost a poem of a review. It was very in-depth. Uh, it explained everything I basically needed to know, which is basically the message in my ebook. In my book, ebook, in this story, I said, this story is for free. Please let me know what works and what doesn't for you. And this reader really went out of her way to let me know uh, what she thought. Super, hyper important stuff for what I wanted to, to understand as a writer. But it doesn't necessarily help me to understand what kind of reader is this person. So what, I, what did I do? I went on Goodreads. And Goodreads, for the maybe three people that don't know, and they're listening to us, so they don't know. It's the biggest social media of readers and authors. So it's a very important platform that uh, you can use to understand your audience. So what did I do? I uh, checked her name on, uh, on the Goodreads, and I went on her profile, and I started reading about her, and I started understanding what she liked. I went on, on her list of favorite books, and I studied every single one of them. Every comment... Uh, uh, she um, she gave uh, on uh, a book that she recently uh, read. And I'm doing that uh, on a scale that uh, gives me data I can work on. Thanks to this review and thanks to the fact that I met this reader, I now know a bit better what makes my story tick and what is the kind of audience that is reading my stories. This is something that you can definitely apply on your books. It doesn't matter the genre. It doesn't matter when you're writing, what you're writing, at which, style, at which stage of your author career you're at. You can always learn from readers of your book. Don't stalk them, but follow them. Just try to understand why they like your story and then maybe try to see why they liked it and what kind of people are they. Uh, from what part of the of the world they're in. For example, this person one from, was from the United States, which happens to be also the bedrock of the people that constitute my newsletter. So you really start adding things, making connection, adding, you know, connecting the dots, uh, we say, right? I think this mm -hmm. is an exercise. It might be time-consuming, but at the same time, I do believe, Krista, that if you apply yourself in this baby step, and you write down in whatever you, way you want to write it down. It can be in a notebook or can be in keeping it in your head as a note. Why that person took 5, 10, 30 minutes of their life to write a review. And you try to understand what person is this. is going to really help you figure out the question, what kind of audience likes my story? And at that point, you can double your effort on finding readers that are more of the, on that genre. I do find this to be an interesting exercise. I do not know if you believe me crazy, Krista. I do want your opinion on that. Um, and uh, since we also have like uh, touched the newsletter point, uh, I was wondering if there is a way for us to also understand from that part of our platform. Yes. So 
I don't think you're crazy. I did basically the same experiment about <laughs> yeah. 18 months ago. Yeah. And that was how I seriously ramped up my newsletter list was actually by going through and um, I made a whole bunch of my stories free. I made the first novella in each series free. And I just wanted to get as many people onto my list as I could because I wanted to email them and I wanted to ask them questions. So for most of that first year of my newsletter, I was just asking people questions about them, like, you know, welcome to the Rivers End Book Club, basically. And and I'm treating it like a book club and that these are not followers. These are other people who are choosing to spend time in my world with me. And so the most interesting sets of information I've gotten have been as people using a direct reply to my email. And I don't, I don't have a newsletter. Like it's, it's not that kind of a mailing list. I just send emails to people and that mentality helps me not make it too salesy and not make it too newsletter ish. And I think makes people more comfortable in hitting that reply button to talk to me. And I found the interactions I was having people with people on like Facebook or wherever are super superficial. They're very public. So people are not very forthcoming with any kind of personal stories or anything. But through my mailing list, I was literally sending emails to people who were then replying like we were having a conversation on a regular email chain. And so I got to know a lot of my readers, my ARC team, especially, and that's, you know, it's over a hundred people, but, but Yes, it takes time because you have to read all the emails that come back and process and, you know, it is a conversation, but I believe that those relationships deserve that energy and it comes back a hundredfold when you look at the level of engagement from those people and, and then they, they, I mean, they care about me, I care about them, you know, it, it goes both ways. And so I think that has been, that is my most favorite way of connecting with my readers to the point where I've actually eliminated almost all my social media channels and everything else. They still exist, but they're basically, they've been paused for a time because I, it's not where I want to put my energy. I find the most rewarding interactions with the readers coming from that mailing list and um, the emails back and forth. So I have freed up the time that I might have spent on very superficial interactions in social media so that I would have the time to read and reply to the things that folks are sending. And it, it's an instant panic reaction for most authors when I say, oh, everything I send out, I invite people to email me back. And there's this sort of gasp with <laughs> horror. Um, well, how could you possibly get anything done? And I'm like, most people don't take you up on it. They just like to be asked. And so, you know, you, you don't talk to all your friends every day. Like, that's not how that works. You have different relationships with different people. And it's just like that. It's some people will be more emaily than others. And um, they also often are happy to tell you all kinds of things. I ask what kinds of books are people loading onto their Kindles for spring break or, you know, what's another book that you absolutely loved in the same genre? Because I'm a reader first before I'm a writer, actually. So I, I need more books to put on my Kindle. I want to know um, what do people love that's in my genre. And from a strategy point of view, that helps because you then know what people are reading and liking. You have other authors you could maybe do a newsletter swap with because you know they'd have a similar-ish audience. And it just opens up lots of other areas. But um, yeah, I think that's what works best for me is knowing that that is my preferred method of communication. It doesn't feel spammy or awkward or uncomfortable, like personality wise, I can just be myself in there. And it's just a really nice way to interact with people. And I think what feels like a more meaningful personalized way than a lot of the other sort of mass communication options. Um, how do I gather feedback is is mostly looking at the engagement statistics on my newsletter. So just like you said before, knowing where are people from, which helps me to know what time zone is it there? What issues might they be facing? You know, there, there's been a couple of times where there's been some pretty awful disaster -y things kind of going on in the world. And, you know, being able to send out a message that just says, I, I hope, you know, those of you who are in these areas are staying safe and warm with a good book and a hot cup of tea and some good friends or whatever it lets you personalize your messaging and and it also helps you stay in touch with 
what else might be going on? Because as much as we don't want to think this, we we are not everyone's first priority. <laughs> so, you know, you may be launching a book and there's a lot of other stuff going on in the world. We pick these arbitrary launch dates and then life happens. And I know I've had a few times where I've sent out a message to my review crew and been like, hey, you know, the book is up. I'd love for the reviews to get posted in the next 48 hours. And you know, I'll, I'll get a, a panicked email back from somebody on the review crew who's like, I'm in the hospital. Like, I don't think I'll be able to get to this in time. Can I still like, stay on the review crew? And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> yes. Just take care of yourself, please. This is, and I think remembering that, like, it's easy to get very like, oh, there's, you know, 25 slots on here. And if you don't review inside of 48 hours, you're out kind of thing. I've seen emails from authors with that kind of a tone, but like there are people on the other end of these emails and you don't know what's happening in their lives. And so I think just remembering that is that they're not just people, they are a person, an individual who is living a life. And if you can respect that and act accordingly, your relationship with those readers is a real relationship. It's an actual thing. It's not just a commercial transaction or you asking for a favor. Um, and that comes through, I think. People understand that. They feel that difference. If you actually care about them, it completely changes the way your business will work. Um, and I think that's true of any, we are in a customer service business, whether we want to look at it like that or not. And your customers are 100% of the value of your business because the only way you make money is if people buy your stories and they become part of your world. And so- Respecting that is extremely important and acknowledging that your readers are your business. Um, that's all there is to it. The stories are the medium you're connecting through, but but they are a tool as much as anything else. But the relationship with those people is what drives the success of your business. Um, yep. Yeah. No, I was just uh, about to say, and we both have or are having experience uh, we both worked, uh, in my case also work in the customer service. Uh, I think uh, I can relate very much in what you're saying. It's the way you talk with that person, with, you establish a relationship that makes everything. Um, and I believe because we are authors, we have to add uh, another level on that thing. And I just, and I don't want to be somebody that gives guidelines or anything, but I do believe uh, uh, this when I'm saying it, that I respect uh, every single readers reader that I have. If there is an opinion on uh, one of our stories, uh, I do believe it's important for us to pay attention to every single one of them. Bad, medium, and awesome. <laughs> I mean, the awesome are gonna make our day, and maybe the bad one are gonna break it. It's just part of the process. But because this podcast episode, it is about the audience, like how to reach it, how to build it. I think what you just said, Krista, it's like something that should be written in the wall of everybody's home. It is important to establish a relationship with these people because they are investing time over us. Either, that either you think of yourself as a brand or you think of yourself as, as a storyteller. Even if you think of yourself as an entrepreneur or just a person that wants to write stories and make sure that they are out there to connect with the most people possible, you have to realize there is another human being on the other side. This is huge. This is so much important because when readers write our stories, basically they are entering our own mind, our own words. And uh, I think the most important thing that we can do is respect this jump of faith. There are a bazillion stories out there. Remember that this person stopped on Amazon, clicked the button, and downloaded yourself, a part of yourself, in uh, that uh, Kindle device or, or uh, that computer. It is our job to listen to them. It is our job to understand what worked and what didn't by reading reviews. And there's one thing about reviews that is super important, uh, and I'm just going to open, uh, gonna open a parenthesis because I tried and I, I started doing it. I read my bad reviews uh, in the coffee shop uh, or uh, outside of home, basically, because uh, Crystal thought is that uh, uh, if there is a bad or a critic, 
review. Uh, if you can have that audience feedback when there are other people around, you're going to be able to internalize it a bit better, more constructively. Close parenthesis. But yeah, try to read <laughs> your bad reviews outside. <laughs> what I'm trying to say here is just a more fundamentally a basic thing that uh, it doesn't matter where you're coming from, uh, the reader needs uh, uh, your respect. And I think it's important to underline this, even though you just said uh, uh, it. And I don't know if I'm, I'm being too I don't know, sentimental or cheesy, but I do believe on this. This is part of the brand that I am. And this is part I know of the brand that you are, Crystal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we both have very people focused brands. And that is something that's important to acknowledge. Not everyone is going to come to it from the same place. But we both I mean, we podcast, we are public about certain parts of our lives. We like to do events. We are not maybe the most introverted of introverted writers. I think that we're both people people. And so that that is at the heart of the stories that we tell and how those things work. So yes, results may vary. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, if, if it's not your thing, don't pretend to be that. Just, you know, figure out what will work for you. But I think there are some really actually quite easy and practical ways that you can connect with your readers from a quality perspective. So one of those is using the, and it seems counterintuitive, but using the text-based email options for your mailing list, it doesn't have to look super fancy and perfect in order to get people's attention. If it looks like a real, a real email from a person, which it <laughs> is, and it feels like an email, people are going to reply to that and they're going to feel like you've sent them a message. Most people in the world don't realize the mechanics behind personalizing an email. So, you know, we've noticed with our writers group, even who are all writers who have some knowledge of the business and the tools, when we send out an update and we use the first name personalization, they reply like they have to tell us, oh, I can't make the meeting or whatever, because they think we sent that email just to them. They don't, they don't process that it is in fact a bulk email. Um, and that works for you, right? It's all of the mailing services have this personalization option on my sign up forms on my website. When I'm asking people to put in their name and email in the name field, the label is what do your friends call you, right? What do you want your friends to call you? Because I want to be their friend when I'm addressing them. I want to be familiar and for them to feel comfortable. And so, you know, it's up to them to put what they want in that field. And maybe one of, you know, there's probably people in my mailing list that have, you know, Mr. Snuffleupagus or whatever, <laughs> because they didn't want to put their real name. And I don't care if that if that makes them laugh every time they see it. Perfect. That's great. Um, but I think using that personalization Remembering as you're writing your communications, whether it's on social or through your mailing list, just talk to a person on the other end of it um, and use language that is comfortable for you and it feels like what fits with your books, right? Um, your brand wants to be consistent. So regardless of the level of, of you-ness in your brand, right? It, it might be that you have created an author persona. You might be writing under a pen name, but everything within that pen name's brand needs to feel authentic. It needs to match up. It needs to be in alignment with what you have created. And so um, using your language, using your, your image choices, using you know the questions you ask people and the way all of that experience feels it takes a lot of energy to edit yourself. So to be something other than you are takes a very conscious effort and a lot of energy and a lot of work and time. And so just to be aware as you're setting up your strategy as an author and your brand as an author, be aware that you want to keep that brand as authentic as you can you know it's like if you're if you're trading for the CIA and you're going to be a spy you need to keep your story as close to reality as possible because that's less to remember right you don't want to have to remember all the details of what you said or didn't say and so you you're basically you're a spy when you have a pen name you're basically you're, you're a spy. You're an undercover agent. You have created a fake persona. You are living that fake persona to the point where it needs to be real to other people. 
you are a spy. So read some books on spycraft, do a little bit of investigation um, into how that works and follow the guidelines, right? You want to make it as easy to maintain as possible with the least amount of divergent points. And no, you don't have to say everything about your private life, but make sure there's an element of truth in everything that you are saying. So, you know, I could write um, to my mailing list and talk about a challenge I faced in my week and, you know, how I found myself wondering how a certain character would solve it from one of my books and, you know, put on that personality to get you through that challenging time. I do that all the time. It's just a coping mechanism, but it's also an interesting mental exercise. And I can talk about something that feels personal. I don't have to say the name of my child or the fact that, you know, particulars about the parenting situation, it's the essence of that experience that is what people are going to relate to, right? That moment in parenting where you're like, wow, I failed that and I'm the worst parent ever in the history of the world. I don't have to reveal any details about my kid, my family, my anything else, but I am able to share that experience and that feeling with other people who can relate. So I think we have a lot of sort of fear around revealing personal things um, in, in our connecting with readers, but you can reveal personal things in a non-specific way. So I think just cracking yourself open a little bit, being a little bit generous with what you offer up in a safe way is a smart way to do that and really make a genuine connection with the people on the other end of your stories. Specific tools for connecting with readers. I feel like there are a couple of things that are really super relevant, easy to use, not super expensive that give you an opportunity to connect with people. So, Mikael, what are the most sort of must have tools that you have found in connecting with your readers? Now, I've been experiencing in the past few months, um, one of the um, resources, one of the resources that I name the most um in the past few episodes is probably book funnel i'm gonna use it again but there is a reason again i'm not just uh you know blocked on that um, and they're not a sponsor so to be clear yeah, not, we uh, are they're not anything, anything we mention <laughs> yeah anything we mention is just because it's awesome i've been using that uh, and i do find that the book funnel can be a community builder in this sense bear with me okay now, BookFunnel has a feature which is very interesting if you purchase at least the middle uh, plan uh, that allows you to participate in book promos. What is a book promo? A book promo is basically an author gives the possibility to several authors of his or her genre to participate in uh, what I would call a, a collective act of trust, which is basically this. Let's say I'm a science fiction author and Crystal too. You are a science fiction author, okay? Done. Bear with me, okay? Um, I will create a page in which I say, okay, book funnel, uh, amazing authors. Here is this my page. I want to create a book promo about uh, science fiction uh, books with a strong uh, woman lead character, okay? If you got one of these books, I want to hear from you, Crystal, okay? I want to definitely hear from you. So I will create this space and I will uh, give some uh, specifics. I will, uh, uh, I will tell you what exactly is accepted and not. For example, maybe erotica is not accepted is if there is like a steaming scene in, in your novel. So there are some guidelines that you have to respect. And then there is a time frame. So maybe this book promo is going to last for a couple of weeks. Why is this important for you now? Why is it, is it important for the audience building? Because of something that I'm going to say now. When I create this page and Krista decide, okay, this is something I might be interested in. I'm going to participate with one or two books that I have. Other authors like myself and Krista might join us. So this page becomes for one, me, myself, and Krista, two, can be three, four, 12, 20, 30 different authors pulling together their weight to promote this page that will feature all this lovely book of science fiction with a strong female lead character. Now, it's requested one only thing to all these people that I have gathered under this page to please share this page. Please 
you can do it once or twice. Please use your newsletter, use your social media, and then there are no other rules. Share the love, that's the rule. Now, I've been doing this for a couple of times. I did see the result. People that are interested, and only people that are interested in science fiction with the lead female character are going to browse this page. And people that are only interested in my cover, and maybe are going to click to this cover and see the description, I'm going to download my book. And by downloading it, maybe I put a feature that is like, please subscribe to my newsletter. When you are downloading this, you can unsubscribe at any moment. What do you think is the result? The result is that I will have, over time, more people that are interested in the genre I'm writing or that I'm selling or that I'm sharing in my mailing list. And I have uh, uh, noticed, Crystal, I have to say, that every single time I send a follow-up uh, um, email to this newsletter that is growing by the day, the engagement rate is very high because these people are interested in what I'm saying. Because these people are following authors that are similar to myself in the things that I published. I do believe uh, if you have to choose one thing and maybe you are starting out, book funnel, it is one way you can gather an audience. It's one of the instruments we talked about. I'm going to quote just another two, if you allow me, my dear. One is story, origin. I, I, I do hope that I'm uh, pronouncing this correctly, which is another uh, community-based uh, 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 platform that is at the moment I'm talking I think is still free and the curator is extremely responsible uh, uh, it's still uh, testing it's still on the beta process uh, of creating this platform but you can do some book swamps and newsletter swamps stuff like that um, and there is also a uh, prolific uh, works if I'm not mis mistaken that you can uh, uh, do a similar kind of thing but this is a paid service so the point is you can gather a community in a relatively short amount of time. I've been doing this for a month and a half. That's it, not more than that. But I did see the result and I did see results that are um, replicable, that can be used for people and author at different stage of their author career, writing different genre. At least give it a try. Just try and see if that works for you. If it doesn't work, write me an email and tell me how bad <laughs> I've been. Uh, what do you think uh, are the best uh, uh, tools that uh, uh, writers that are listening to us can use? Yeah, I'm with you on the book funnel one. That definitely, I think on top of being able to connect with other authors and do promotions and stuff, um, the beauty of the tool is when we look at ourselves as being in customer service, yes, you could just email your book files to people who were looking to get their book onto or your book onto their device. So if we look at how we're connecting with our review crew or our ARC team, I use BookFunnel to deliver those copies because I don't want to provide tech support to all the people who are trying to figure out how the heck you get a Kindle file from an email attachment onto your Kindle. I don't know if anyone's ever tried to do that. It's not like the most straightforward of processes. There's a couple ways to do that, but they are not uber friendly. And most of us would rather be writing more books than trying to talk. You know, I, I just, I always picture my grandma when I'm doing this process. I don't want to try to talk my grandma through how to get the file out of the computer and into her Kindle, right? Don't want to do it. So I think that's, that's another way, like really we're reducing barriers to sharing a story with our readers. And you can share audio files, you can share um, any format of digital files through BookFunnel. You can even get like cards printed that have BookFunnel codes on them. And if you're going to in-person events, you can give them away or you can sell them. You can have people pay you $2 to download your ebook directly. Like it just opens up all kinds of interesting options. And I think that's one of the things to always evaluate when you're looking at a new tool. Does it only work for one part of the process or can it actually do three or four things for me? Does it simplify you know, five other aspects of me connecting with my readers. So I agree with you. That is sort of the primary thing that you probably need. Um, another one is book brush, because when you are looking at connecting with people and you're wanting to make nice looking images for social, or you want to make, you know, promo video bits and pieces or whatever, as part of your consistency of your brand, you want things to look polished. So 
book brushes is kind of the, the tool that lets you wrap all of that stuff up in a really pretty package. And so I would use book brush potentially to make an image for the, if I was going to drop an image into my mail out to my readers, I might make it in book brush and then drop it into that email. If I am trying to make something that's easy for my friends to share, right? Whether they're other authors or readers, you can say, oh, you know, here's a Facebook post, like click here to share this with your own audience. If, if you've got a book for free or whatever, and you're trying to let people know about it, um, sharing is caring. I put that in all kinds, of, it's super cheesy, but I put that all the time in my newsletter and people do share. Like the, the asking for the obvious is, is really helpful. And if you make it as easy as possible for them to do it, then they will. So whether you're organizing a book funnel promo or asking your mailing list to share your new book with just one friend who they think might like it, it's the same thing. The easier you make that, the easier it is for them to just do it without barriers. I think other tools, I mean, your mailing list, whatever tool you're using to manage that is huge. So it doesn't so much matter which one you choose. There's MailChimp, there's MailerLite. ConvertKit is they don't really have a free option or they didn't have a free option. So that's a little trickier. Mail poet is one that goes directly into your, the back end of your WordPress website as um, a plugin. So some people like that just so you're not managing two spaces. Send Fox is a new one that's out. I'm test and I have used or am currently testing all of these platforms just to, to be clear. I'm not skewed in any one direction at the moment. They all do pretty much the same thing. It really just depends which one can you find a steal of a deal on, which one will let you use for free in the beginning while you kind of figure your stuff out. Um, we'll do a whole separate episode on mailing list platforms at a future date. But um, for now, just know this: which one you choose doesn't matter as long as you are comfortable with it. That's the key. And you can check out links for some of those options in the show notes. And uh, I will hopefully be able to direct you to some additional resources that might help you make that choice as well. But I mean, really, that's it. I think your own personality is your biggest tool when it comes to connecting with readers. And of course, the David Gochran books, um, Strangers to Superfans is huge. And the book Newsletter Ninja by Tammy Labreck, if you're diving into the newsletter land, is one that is a very, very good starting place. Yes, there sir. Was, there was another resource. I have to admit, I don't remember the name of the gentleman that uh, came up with the article, but it's 1,000 True Fans, uh, the title. Yes. For this, uh, I think it's very, very interesting. I read it for the first time in the book uh, by Timothy Ferry's uh, Tools of Titans. Very, very simple stuff, uh, but very, very true stuff. So I think like uh, it's important because we're talking about audience to find the right audience, and you can actually make a living uh, out of what you're doing if you really have 1,000 true fans, like not like yes. fan Facebook fans, like really... People that will buy your product in different, like paperback, um, art cover, audiobook. Like, uh, it's really, really somebody that connects with you. And uh, one of the things that I would add is like uh, something that we've been repeating, like uh, mad people, which is like try to do different things, but try to understand what is the thing that you can keep doing for a long amount of time. Something that is repeatable. Something that it's uh, it's going to be hard, of course, but it's like writing. If you exercise on a daily basis, it becomes part of your routine. So try not to spread your resources a bit too thin. Test, gather the data, and then decide following the 80 and 20% rule. Very, very important. Yes, absolutely. Um, and just incremental progress, right? You. So I, I heard the other day, which just reminded me, um, of this concept that, you know, if you are sailing a boat and you are turned one degree off course, you'll end up on a different continent, like it's, you know, but you can really severely alter the course you're taking by adjusting things on purpose that one degree, right? It's small, small changes. So for you as a focus on connecting with your readers, think of it from a customer service perspective. What can you do in one situation in that moment that will turn the person you are interacting with into a true fan. So, you know, I've had a couple interesting examples of this where I 
somebody was very upset that they hadn't been able to re review the books and they were emailing me from the hospital. They were on dialysis treatment at the time. And they said, you know, my eyes, because of the health stuff I'm going through, my eyes aren't very good and I'm really having trouble reading stuff. So I don't know if I'm going to be able to read the books and, and post the reviews. I'd really like to. And I was like, at first I was like, oh my God, okay, don't worry about that, obviously. But also, how can I help them get the stories? And because I have audio editions, I said, you know what, I can send you a link, you can just download the audiobooks. And so I was able to send her some links for the audiobooks, and she was able to still be a part of the community. And, you know, we were back and forth after that. So I think just most really positive customer reviews actually come from taking a problem and turning it around in an interesting way that works out better for everybody in the end. Um, so if you have an experience where maybe you screw up something about your mailing list and you send out an email that wasn't the one you wanted, or maybe you have a technical glitch and somebody was really struggling with downloading one of one of your things, like, is there a way you can kind of make it up to them for the extra effort they expended to get to a good result? Can you give them a bonus one, right? Maybe because you can always give out an art copy of your book, no matter what, you know, programs you're part of. So use your book funnel to for good. It's, it's basically a superpower. You, you have books, you are an author, and you have a tool that will deliver them to your readers. So throw something in for fun. Maybe you sign a bookmark and mail it to them, whatever it is. Like there are ways to escalate that customer experience. And there's a book by Dan and Chip Heath called The Power of Moments, which is all about creating memorable moments in people's lives. And it is a fantastic read if you are looking at that sort of bundle of resources to transform people from strangers to super fans. Um, it, it teaches you all about what makes for a memorable moment. And it's a, an interesting read, but I think would also be very helpful for you as an author trying to figure out how to really connect with people. Um, that would be a good starting place. It's that moment, my dear, it's that moment. It is that moment. We are making magical moments here with our little curious jar. I got all excited. I took the top off already. But, I get excited. Okay. I get fearful. <laughs> okay. Pick, you tell me Sorry. when to stop. Keep going. Keep going. I don't feel it. Okay. No, 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 no. Pick it. Okay. It's orange one this time. Okay. Are you set? Yeah. All yes. right. Are you ready? Are you ready? Oh, my word. Okay. So... You can pick just one book to take with you on a colonizing expedition to Mars. What book do you take? Oh. <laughs> if, you're, if you're listening to this as a podcast, you might want to pop over to the video one just so you can see Michele's tortured face as he tries to think about this. <laughs> totally it worth it. So bad. Listen must have been a very a, a good bad person very smart very evilish um okay i'll go first um only one book uh can i bring like a kindle loaded with stuff no <laughs> um, okay i'll just tell you the first one that comes to my mind okay um it will probably be uh, the silmarillion by uh tolkien and I mentioned that in a previous episode, why I uh, really liked it for the music and the world building and the story. It's like every, time, every single time I think about it, I feel like that book is like a thousand billion different books. And uh, it's so much said. Um, it's not a huge book. It's big, but uh, there are so many stories across so many, I believe, thousands of years uh, that... Uh, I don't think that a book like that can ever get old for me. And every single time you read that, uh, uh, nuances of the same story is going to pop up and say, this is a new book. This is a new story. This is something new. So every single time you read it, it's like you're reading a new book. I know this is applicable to every single book, I guess. But I think The Silmarillion for me has a magic in it because I enjoyed every book I've read by uh, Tolkien. And I do believe... Uh, 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 Christopher, which is the uh, the son of the the, the Madi author, did a great job in uh, 
let's say packaging this product uh, and uh, publishing it uh, and uh, i think tolkien's family is and tolkien himself is represented in this uh, work of art i think i think it's really a work of art there are music in the words and it is the foundation of what we think fantasy is right here right now at more than half a century in the distance so I don't know if it makes any sense, but I'm a fa fantasy aficionado, so um, I should have br I should have brought also the Foundation series by Asimov. You see, now I'm thinking, st <laughs> stop me now. Okay, that that was my answer. Go go for it. Okay. Um. Yeah. So at first, my instinct was like Pride and Prejudice is one of my all-time favorite books, and I've read it hundreds of times. But then I was like, I could actually rewrite that book because it's all in my head. I'm not bringing that one. It would be a waste. So I did this little like cataloging of the books that I've read enough times to know that I would want to read them again. And I was like, no, I could put that together. I could rewrite The Princess Bride. Like, so what I want is the biggest, fattest, thinnest lined <laughs> notebook that I'm allowed to bring. I want an empty journal so that I can put all of the stories that are my favorites from my head into that book in really like small, small condensed print. That's, that's what I want. I don't know. I feel like it's yeah. cheating though. I want the name <laughs> of, uh, I want the title and I want the name. This is cheating. I was like, yeah, I if I, if I had to just pick one, it would probably be Pride and Prejudice. I absolutely love that book. I have okay. Pride and Prejudice like writing mittens. I have the scarf with the proposal scene. <laughs> I have all of the Jane Austen. Like Clueless was my favorite movie because it was like an Emma spinoff. Yeah, no, I, I'm all about. I'm all about that. Miss Austen is my favorite. I hold the, I have you accountable in this uh, particular. Episode. Yeah, we're trying fair, to sneak around, fair. but you see, okay. audience, we keep ourselves accountable. You see that? You see that? <laughs> All right. If you have, well, okay. If if you have ideas about what book you would take, we want you to put them in the comments, in the show notes. We want to hear it. Come to strategicauthorpreneur.com, find the episode, answer the curious jar question in the comments. And if you have a question, if you would like to create the tortured face of my lovely co-author <laughs> here next time, then you should send your questions to ideas at strategicauthorpreneur.com. See exactly how tough of a job you can give us trying to answer these questions. Now, for show notes, links to resources we mentioned, and coupons or discounts on tools we love, you can visit us at strategicauthorpreneur.com. And if you subscribe to our newsletter, each week we'll send you just one thing that we think will help you on your authorpreneur journey and a link to our latest episode. And you will get the gold star and a million bonus points in the game of life, if you leave, you leave a review, even small, for us, uh, wherever you are listening to this podcast. Okay. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy life to get to know us. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on our next episode, where we will be talking with author and social media extraordinaire, Liza Palmer, who is going to give us the inside scoop on what's happening with social media these days and some interesting ideas about how to apply that in our author lives. So until then, I don't know what, do whatever the hell you want, but come back <laughs> for the next episode. <laughs> <laughs> this is was honestly was, funny. Up, that would have been hilarious. Yeah, no. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Whatever. It's okay. It's new done. rule. It's we'll so. just leave it running all the time. Yeah, all the time. That? This is the last episode of the introduction. Okay, so behave, yes. be sparkling, be awesome, be etc. 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 This is the, about end, the lawyer. It's the end of the beginning. This yes. is like act one, like transition. Here we go. The journey is about to begin in like for real. Yeah. 100%. Okay, end of the beginning. Here we go. Hey there, strategic entrepreneurs. I'm Crystal Hunt. And I'm Michela Mitrani. We are here to help you save time, energy, and money as, we, as you level up your writing career. Let's do this again. <laughs> 
<laughs> you can save this one and put it in the show notes. Oh, you go. I figured it. there'd be more chances. <laughs> okay. Eat it. <clears throat> oh, I have to start again. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, on behalf of the both of us, I would like to thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy life uh, to get to know us, uh, what we're talking about, uh, and do be sure to subscribe uh, so you don't miss out uh, on the next episode where it's going to be uh, put out, uh, where we're going to dive into the business of being an entrepreneur. <laughs> no. Oh, I read that in the... <laughs> I may have forgotten to update that line. Yeah. Okay, this this piece it goes uh, in the very last bit. Okay, you promised me. You promised me okay. because there was the heavy laugh, the maleficent laugh, and my face. I was like, no, you did this again to me. You did this again to me. You did this again to me. This is the second time. Unintentionally. Yeah. Um. Okay. So I'll just do that. <laughs> okay. Go. Oh, okay. I have to stop laughing first. Okay. <laughs> you're the worst. Uh, <laughs> are, you, are you sure you're not doing this like on purpose? You get material for your like uh, last uh, 10 seconds stuff. <laughs> I have the best outtakes from the interviews with people. Oh my God. It's going to uh, be amazing. I'm going to look forward to that because I can see your devilry and uh, in the making and I want to see how do you treat the other lovely guests so, like you must be mistreating them what did you do with Eileen what did you do with her like, I didn't do anything to her I just asked them to say welcome to the strategic entrepreneur podcast and none of them can do it so it's hilarious <laughs>